Well, hello, everybody, and um, welcome to our third um, this year of the Inter U.S. Inter -Council, Interagency Council on Homelessness meetings. Um, it's nice to have everybody around the table again, and I um, want to thank our host, Secretary Donovan, for um, having us here today and for his ongoing commitment and leadership and all the great partners around the table. We have a lot on the agenda, as we usually do, um, and we have uh, tried to keep some more time available today for discussion. I know that's been um, often an afterthought at the meetings before we've packed them so full, so I, I hope that all of you will get a chance to um, lend your thoughts and ideas to this process going forward. Um, we want to have a discussion about um, family homelessness, and uh, we have some great partners here today to talk about that. Uh, we have a progress report on our opening doors agenda, and I'm going to try to keep us uh, staying on time. Um, with us today, we've got uh, Michelle Flynn from the Road Home in Salt Lake County, Utah, and Michael Mira from Tacoma Housing Authority. Um, and they're going to both give us their thoughts about preventing and ending family homelessness. Um, I do also want to recognize that um, from our department, we have with us Brian Samuels, who you all know, um, our commissioner on uh, youth and families, but also our um, agency administrator, George Sheldon, has joined us today. And um, we have uh, an exciting announcement to make. Uh, when our council was meeting last June, uh, we talked about accepting proposals for the partnerships to demonstrate the effectiveness of supportive housing for families in the child welfare system grants and that that was a real opportunity. And the grants were actually awarded today. Um, these grants are going to couple stable housing with comprehensive services for families involved in the child welfare system, a real target population. Communities identified HUD housing resources at, at the local level that are going to be used in the demonstration projects, and HUD will provide supports linked to the resources. So this is a real collaborative effort of us targeting vulnerable families and working with HUD. We've awarded a million dollars a year to each of the five grantees for the next five years, $25 million total. And the demonstration is supported in part um, with an additional $10 million by philanthropic organizations who are here, I think, at the meeting. So I think we have representatives here from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, from Edna McConnell-Clark Foundation, from the Casey Family Programs, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Are you all here? And could we thank you for those efforts? And I want to particularly recognize um, our Commissioner Brian Samuels for his vision in uh, putting together this demonstration. The five grantees are the Four Oaks Family and Children's Services in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the State of Connecticut Department of Children and Families in Hartford, Connecticut, Kids in Distress, Inc., Wilton Manors, Florida, Community Alliance for Homelessness in Memphis, Tennessee, and the San Francisco Human Services Agency, not surprisingly, in San Francisco. Um, so I think you see we've got a pretty broad geographic range, um, some different partners, some you know not-for-profit groups, some a state group, a local group, and I think it will give us a real opportunity to you know, figure out strategies that really work, capture some best practices, and drive um, these initiatives forward. So we're really excited about that, and I wanted to open the meeting um, sharing that good news with you. I also should uh, mention that we do have um, folks joining us by teleconference uh, today once again, um, and we want to welcome uh, those 
listeners uh, who are out there with us today as a part of this meeting agenda. Um, I want to just tee up our guests today by just giving you a, a little snapshot of, of where we hope to go with this session. Um, what we know is that mainstream resources are critical to preventing and ending homelessness among families. And though they're not specifically targeted to people experiencing homelessness, homeless families are often eligible for mainstream resources based on factors like income. All federal agencies have mainstream programs, and it's important for the programs to complement one another. We think it's also very important to identify the ways that mainstream programs touch homeless families and make sure that the programs are connected to other federal programs. Um, so rather than just looking at homelessness as an isolated silo and looking at grant funding that might be available just in that category, what we all have are probably programs that really intersect with families who may find themselves homeless, but we don't necessarily see them through that lens. Um, I want to turn to Barbara to give um, a little bit of additional framework and then introduce our panelists and guests with us today. Great. Barbara. Thank you. Well, again, thank you, Secretary Sibelius, for your leadership of the council. Thank everyone who is with us in the room today. Phone, is, oh, I already messed up, yes. So welcome. Uh, I especially want to thank all of those who are joining us via the webcast, uh, as well as those who are here in the room. As Secretary Sibelius has said, um, the intersection uh, that we create between mainstream services and targeted programs is really important because it's a real solution to homelessness. And these programs that we are have been most focused on have been those that include everything from Medicaid to public housing to education to TANF. And uh, we are really encouraging communities to blend these resources together in a way that uh, is more important than in the past. Uh, we are joined today by two speakers who really have been able to move from just a targeted assistance only approach in their community to one that really blends those mainstream resources in with the targeted programs. Uh, and they are going to highlight the ways that this has worked in their community. Uh, we also want to note that they are brought to us because they have been extremely innovative in their approaches. They have been using the evidence um, that exists to implement the best practices, but they also are creating some new evidence that will be useful for other communities. And the work that they've done has really um, been to streamline and avoid the duplication of effort. And so they're really model communities, and we hope as we engage with them, um, they can bring forward their uh, the strategies that they have found to be most useful in their community and that intersection of services delivery and the intersection with um, the public policy perspective. So with that, I want to start out by introducing um, Michelle Flynn and let you know that she has been uh, with the Road Home in Salt Lake City for a number of years and has been quite the innovator there. We've been fans of her work for a long time. The Road Home is a very comprehensive agency that provides everything from emergency shelter to transitional housing and um, ha most recently has been implementing really innovatively rapid rehousing. Uh, and she has had a great partner in the state of Utah. You know, many of you will recall we featured the state of Utah in the past for their innovations. And she's going to talk about how they've used evidence-based practice to build a real continuum. Uh, she's joined um, on the panel by Michael Mira, and Michael um, is the director of the Tacoma Housing Authority, and I've had the pleasure of, of visiting with Michael in his, in his home and seeing the great work that they're doing there. Um, Michael is one of those housing agencies that has really reached out and worked with the local continuum of care, reached across um, into the school system, and really they've created some model working there. So we're really delighted to have Michael um, joining him, joining us. Michael's one who his work has been about the evidence and creating new evidence. And so I think we can listen to what he's learning as they're building the evidence and how they've been modifying their programs in ever more innovative ways. So um, they each get to make a five minute presentation. And um, I think I'll turn it back over to you and see if we want to do introductions of others or just proceed. Want them to speak? I would say let's proceed. Great. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara and Secretary Sibelius, Secretary Donovan, for being here. Um, and the invitation to talk with you about the road home and our comprehensive approach to ending family homelessness in Salt Lake. 
Through our year-round and winter season programs, we, provide shelter, we provided shelter to 659 families last year. Of those families, 572 moved out of the shelter due in large part to the partnerships and collaborations we have with housing authorities, service partners, and our local and state and federal agencies. At the Road Home, we operate as a housing first shelter. The heart of our program is rapid rehousing. We gear our programs towards helping families move out of homelessness as quickly as possible with an initial infusion of services while they're at the shelter and to housing. As the central rapid rehousing agency in Salt Lake County, we provide the service to our partner agencies who work with families uh, experiencing domestic violence. We work with families referred by our local school district liaisons and another family uh, church-based shelter program. Our rapid rehousing program was built with the infusion of HUD, homeless prevention and rapid rehousing HPRP dollars in October of 2009. We also had at that time a large commitment from the state temporary assistance for needy families TANF funds, and those two funds really provided the backbone. All families in our emergency shelter have the opportunity to be assessed for housing after seven days. The assessment and the services provided are very focused on identifying and mitigating housing barriers. The flexibility within the HPRP and TANF funds allowed us for the first time to help pay down a utility debt so a family could get the gas or the electricity turned on in their apartment. That flexibility Flexibility allowed us to pay rental application fees so families could apply for apartments and pay deposits so they could get past that barrier of a big first time um, upfront payment. Through our department partnership with the state DWS um, and TANF, we developed a strong employment component of this program. Families are required to meet with a DWS employment counselor who's on site at our shelters prior to being uh, approved for rapid rehousing. DWS provides each family with a complete employment assessment along with mainstream benefits eligibility review and that family leaves the shelter with a plan to increase their income and employment as soon as they're in housing. A strength of our program is in its service delivery. Following the infusion of services at the shelter, we continue to provide rental assistance and case management once the family is housed for an average of about five months. We continue to work with the 13% who return to homelessness and have successfully rehoused many of them um, often in a little bit more intensive programs. The average length of stay for families in our shelter reduced from 71 days five years ago to 26 days. Our challenge is to continue to operate our family housing program with fidelity to the housing first progressive engagement model that we developed with those TANF and HPRP funds. We know it works best when we offer a small amount of assistance and extend it when needed. For example, we're seeking some more flexibility around rules which unintentionally prevent us from braiding together different kinds of housing support. Specifically, we have a few households that we moved out um, into low-income housing tax credit properties, and we utilize TANF or HPRP to help them move out initially. The advantage of this, of course, is that we get lower rents in a quality program, and we can spread those dollars further. After a few months, we determined that a couple of families needed longer assistance, and we were attempting to use some HUD continuum of care leasing dollars, but that program requires the lease to be in the name of the agency. And in a low-income housing tax credit program, the unit's qualified based on the tenant's income, so we're not able to do that with those funds, so we're looking at solutions around that. This type of frontline flexibility is what is really needed to bring in the resources from a variety of agencies. I'm going to give you just a brief list of our partnerships and resources that originate in all the departments around this table. The TANF funding helps with rental assistance and case management. TANF, TANF and Department of Labor Wagner Pizer funding supports the DWS staff who employed, or provide the employment assistance to our families in the shelter and while they're, uh, after they move into housing. The Department of Education support the school district liaisons who come on, to our shelter, on site to our shelter nearly every day, both bringing us referrals for families that they know are living outside and also getting all of our kids enrolled in school. HUD Emergency Solutions Grant funding helps with deposits and rental assistance and housing location assistance. Other COC funds include shelter plus care and leasing dollars um, for the families that need a little bit longer assistance. The Department of Veterans Affairs, we have a Supportive Services for Veterans Families grant that will begin October 1st. We're excited that will enable us to better serve veteran families and free up the other dollars to extend to additional families. Also the access to the VASH vouchers for those um, households who are uh, experiencing chronic homelessness. Department of Justice domestic, domestic violence funding provides shelter for, for the families um, and who we can then help with rapid rehousing assistance. 
The AmeriCorps and VISTA programs have been crucial. We've had AmeriCorps and VISTA workers um, helping our families identify low-cost apartments, driving them around to find apartments, working with the landlord to describe this program. So we continue to strive to work with a variety of funding streams and sew them together to create this of, backbone of support that will enable our families to look back at their time of homelessness and see it as a mere blip in the scope of their lives. Thank you. Very impressive, Michelle, and we'll get a chance to drill down on some of what you've talked about. Michael, if you want to go forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to visit with you. I'd like to tell you about three initiatives of the Tacoma Housing Authority that will test our ability to serve homeless families efficiently. I'd start by noting four themes to this work that each of these three examples elicit. These themes really arose out of almost 10 years of experience in the Puget Sound area in program design and evaluation led in meaningful ways by the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation, building changes in Washington State and our continuum of care system in Pierce County, which is the county in which the city of Tacoma sits. The first theme is that the mainline programs of public housing and housing choice vouchers we find to be um, not well suited to intervene into family homelessness. For reasons we can discuss if you wish, but it, it pushed us to think of other ways to do business. The second theme would have a housing authority understand its mission broadly, that a housing authority should be interested not just in housing families, but helping them prosper. The Tacoma Housing Authority, for example, has written into its agency strategic mission the goal of helping families succeed not just as tenants, but as parents, students, wage earners, and asset builders. And I've brought a copy of our strategic directives if you would like to see them. The third theme is that a housing authority, if it's lively and alert, must embed itself deeply into a wide-ranging partnership in the community in order to get that work done. And all three of those themes are evident in the examples I'm about to describe. They are all dependent upon the fourth theme, which is the programmatic and financial flexibility of the Moving to Work program. And here I'd like to offer my first thank you to Secretary Donovan for Tacoma Housing Authority's Moving to Work status. We're in our second full year of Moving to Work activities, and we count it to be a transforming authority that allows us to do the following work, among others. First, the Tacoma Housing Authority is redirecting a significant amount of its housing dollars into Pierce County's rapid rehousing program. Pierce County has a rapid rehousing program with many of the elements similar to what Michelle just described in Salt Lake City. And we will redirect our housing dollars into that program to serve homeless families. And I'll ask you to do this thought experiment with us. If we redirected a million dollars of, from, for example, our voucher program, we will serve 130 fewer voucher families. Processed through the rapid rehousing system, we will then be able to save more than 300 families a year from homelessness. We count that as a good use of a housing dollar and makes Tacoma Housing Authority relevant in the local effort to intervene into the crisis of homelessness when otherwise we are actually um, very much less relevant. The, um, the housing dollars used in this way represent only about 3% of our voucher dollars, but used in that way could intervene in more than a third of the homeless families who come who surface for assistance in Pierce County every year. The second example 
pertains to Tacoma Housing Authority's education program. Our education project is an experiment on how a housing authority can be situated in how it spends its housing resources to get two other things done. Help the children we house succeed in school, help the schools that serve our communities succeed. And I'll ask you to note that those are two different goals. Our education project has many elements to them, and I'll leave you with a description of the project. I want to tell you about the McCarver Elementary School project. Um, McCarver Elementary School is an important elementary school in Tacoma. It houses the poorest population, or it's, it serves the poorest population of students in the region. It's got the, um, the most homeless children of any school in the region. And it's got all the um, outcomes that we somehow come to expect and accept of a school like that. What caught our attention was the turnover rate among the children that in the past several years ranged from 107 to 170 percent. So if you're the teacher in front of a classroom in September, it means by June your students in the aggregate will have turned over once and in some years almost a second sec a separate time. It's like teaching class in the waiting area depot. And no matter how good that teacher is, all the data shows that the effects of this turnover are destructive for the children who are coming and going and for their classmates who see it happen. This is not a population transient because of occupation. It is not a farm worker population. It is not a military population. It is a population transient because of deep poverty and the homelessness and family dysfunction that comes with it. So when we saw that, we thought, well, we're a housing authority. We have something to say about this. And that began a year's worth of planning and discussion with our school district and a wide array of community partners that resulted in the McCarver Elementary School project, which is now beginning its second year. It has these elements. The first element is we are pouring housing dollars into the school to stabilize it. And we are providing rental assistance to 50 families whose 79 children constitute about a fifth of the school. And providing them with rental assistance that lasts a maximum of five years. Starting high, paying most of the rent, tapering down to zero after five years. The program comes with expectations of those families. The first expectation, um, we actually ask them to sign a blood oath with us, that first says that they have to keep their children at McCarver. So this is um, worth some emphasis. A standard housing strategy to intervene into a school like that is to provide vouchers to families so they can escape and go find themselves a better school. Here we are asking these families to stay in place. The reason we are doing that is because if we had given 50 vouchers to families, they would have left, perhaps, and perhaps to their advantage, but they would have been replaced by another 50 families from the shelter and the school would not have changed. This program is focused as much on the school as it is on those individual families. The other obligation we ask the families to undertake is to do what parents need to do for their children's school success, get them to school on time every day, attend every parent-teacher-student conference, attend every PTA meeting, make homework time and homework space available. We also ask the parents to participate actively in their individualized plan for their own education and employment prospects with a wide array of community partners, including our local workforce investment agency, our local um, Title IV-A, IV-B, IV-E agency. Then we had expectations of the school district. We didn't want to just hand the school district this array of resources. We wanted the school district to step up and use the occasion to do what leading edge thinking suggested to be necessary to turn a school like that around. And here I want to acknowledge the full partnership of the school district that welcomed us warmly into that school. 
And I'll just mention one investment they're making, which is to turn that school into an international baccalaureate primary grade program, which will raise standards among the teachers and the students school-wide. We had the happy chance this summer to host um, HUD Deputy Secretary Maurice Jones when he came to visit McCarver and spent a morning with them learning about this program. The third example I'll give is a collaboration, 16 public housing authorities in Washington State and three mainline nonprofit providers of housing have arranged with our child welfare agency. The um, the gist of it is to prov equip local child welfare workers with more housing resources for their use when in their judgment it would work and is necessary to prevent a foster care placement, to shorten it, or to save a teenager aging out of foster care from homelessness. It's our effort to bolster and improve upon the state's experience with the Family Unification Program, which has had some limitations. We're pretty excited about this, and we think this will be a very good use of a housing dollar, serving families, housers are serving anyway, but without the supportive services that these households need to succeed. I'll mention as well that the state of Washington has included this collaboration in its Title IV-E waiver application, which is presently before HHS. These are three examples of what we count to be the role of a public housing authority that understands its mission broadly and embeds itself deeply in an array of community partners. Thank you. To both um, Michelle and Michael, uh, something's going on in Northwest United States um, that is very exciting and um, gives us a lot of food for thought. Um, recognizing that we have a number of people visiting um, through the teleconference, I don't want to uh, go on to the discussion before I ask the folks around the table to just introduce yourself uh, with your name and your um, agency, and then um, we'll go back and, and have a little bit of discussion. So keep an eye on the questions you want to ask and um, the further discussion. But George, why don't you start? Everybody needs to turn on the mic or the folks can't See, hear. I'm new to this, too. Uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm George Sheldon, the Acting Assistant Secretary for the Administration for Children and Families at, uh, at HHS. I'm Brian Samuels, uh, uh, Commissioner for the Administration of Children, Youth, and Families um, within ACF at HHS. I'm Leanne Oliver, Senior Advisor at the Department of Energy. <coughs> Anthony Walters, I'm a Counselor in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at Department of Interior. Uh, Robert Rabinovitz, I'm the Deputy Chief Economist in the Department of Commerce. <coughs> Philip Burdett from the Defense Department in the areas of Wounded Warrior Care and Transition Policy. Good afternoon. I'm Ben Siegel with the Department of Labor, Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. I'm Andrea Steren, a Program Examiner with the Office of Management and Budget. I'm Melody Haynes with the Department of Justice, and I'm the Acting Administrator for the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Hello, everyone. I'm Wendy Spencer, the CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service. We're AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, VISTA. So happy to hear the shout out, Michelle, and your great success with AmeriCorps and VISTA supporting you. Glad to be here. And I'm Kathleen Sebelius, and when I'm not chairing the Interagency Council on Homelessness, I serve as Secretary of Health and Human Services. Barbara Poppy, I'm the Executive Director of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Uh, Dave Rust. I'm the uh, Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy at the Social Security Administration. Christina Chappie, Chief of Staff, Rural Housing Service at USDA. Susan Angel, Executive Director for the Homeless Veterans Initiative, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, Luke Tate, White House Domestic Policy Council. John McLaughlin, U.S. Department of Education, Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program. Carolyn Austin Diggs, Assistant Deputy Associate Administrator, General Services Administration. Uh, I'm Terry Monrad from the uh, Department of Homeland Security, and I am the Executive Officer 
also from the uh, Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. I'm Lori Timmons. I'm the Consumer Advocate for the United States Postal Service. Uh, Mark Johnston, Acting Assistant Secretary at HUD, uh, overseeing homeless programs. Well, I again want to thank our panelists for being here, and I think um, you've provided a lot of food for thought in terms of the way we can see our programs more broadly. Um, I wanted to start by just saying that we are working on an information memorandum on the use of TANF funds to serve homeless families and families at risk of homelessness. And we hope it will provide sort of a roadmap to people in the field with information about the ways in which homeless families are actually being served through TANF. So it kind of sparks some additional thought. And I want to thank George Sheldon and the Administration on Children and Families um, for their work using TANF as a critical mainstream resource. Um, while I'm thanking George, I want to also recognize that around the perimeter of this room, we have all the folks who basically do the heavy lifting day in and day out to make this initiative move forward. So thanks to all of you. I guess I would start um, the questions for our panelists with, I'm, I'm interested in the catalyst um, for your ability to partner and access mainstream resources. Did you, and I'd, I'd be curious for brief answers from both of you, did you think of this on your own? Did somebody bring it to your attention? Is it a roadmap that you'd followed in the past? And if there are barriers um, from agencies that you've been trying to use mainstream funds, uh, can you give us a little identification of what that is? Can I go first? Um, yes, I think there's a number of catalysts. Uh, when we began the HP, receiving the HPRP funds and we knew we wanted to take off in the rapid rehousing um, model, we had worked prior to that the year before with our State Department of Workforce Services getting some funding for a pilot program on rapid rehousing. So we had traditionally gotten uh, some funding from DWS to help fund our overflow shelter. And we went to them and said to them, can we use a portion of that funding that you usually give us for winter shelter and try this thing, rapid rehousing? And they agreed to that. And it was a very successful program. It was a small number of families. But they were really pleased with that collaboration. So we already had built that um, background with them. In addition, I think key people. Uh, with Department of Workforce Services sp specifically in the TANF program. Um, key people in that administration really looking at homeless families as a priority population that they need to serve and um, in a proactive way. So they're at the table. Uh, the, the act Department of Workforce Services, uh, we first met him when he was a, re a regional manager over Salt Lake County Services, and he started working with us on just employment and employment around homeless individuals and families, and so we have a long history with him um, and just been committed uh, specifically to this cause. So I think those are the key things that, that moved us along. I think some of the challenges really are centered more around the employment side of things, uh, the, the sort of systems, the way that uh, employment assistance is provided to the general public doesn't work for our population. And so we've worked really, we've had to work really hard with our partners at DWS to look at providing services differently. And they've been at the table with us. They have just agreed in this new contract we have coming up to give us um, two or maybe three full-time employment counselors that will work with our families in the shelter and continue to work with that same family once they move out into housing because we saw this sort of lag once families moved out and we referred them to somebody else out in an employment center the connection kind of sometimes would take a couple months to build up again. So we're going to try this new way of they're going to work with the same employment counselor from shelter into housing. So they've just really at the table with us and willing to be flexible. Michael? I feel our initiatives grew out of a very f um, fortunate community in which THA participates in the Puget Sound area of very interested, talented partners, um, which has have been doing this work for over 10 years in heavily evaluated efforts that have taught us a lot. Much of that has been convened by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Building Changes, and we've been listening. And we are also lucky with our community partners that in Tacoma are eager 
for new ways to try things and how our efforts can fit with theirs. Among the challenges, I'll say two things. One, um, I'll emphasize again that from our end, the moving to work flexibility has been critical to making the HUD mainline housing dollars pertinent to these efforts. The other challenge we've not really solved pertains to evaluation. We have pretty robust evaluation efforts wrapped around all these efforts, and that requires an exchange of data that's hard to do especially between school districts and federally funded agencies. Um, asking them to swap data is like asking the CIA and the KGB to swap data. And even for research purposes, getting the data in aggregate form is difficult, and we wish it was not. Great point, and we are actually, uh, as part of our agenda, um, we are looking at how to get education data really um, involved in this whole dialogue, uh, not only in the kinds of situations you're talking about, but just collecting data, making right. sure that we're using the same definitions as we talk about youth homelessness. We don't have good data coming out. So the data element integrated <laughs> among schools, I think, is one of the big challenges that we've agreed to that needs to be very much on the mm -hmm. forefront. I'm going to turn to um, my colleague, our host today, and the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan. Thank you. Um, first of all, just congratulations to both of you for really, really impressive work. I've, I've, as Michelle knows, I visited Utah, and you can really, you can feel that the end of homelessness is in, in sight in Utah, and uh, it's really, it's remarkable work. And, and Michael, uh, looking forward to seeing you at Housing Washington next month uh, out in Tacoma, and uh, the, the work that's being done throughout the Puget Sound, and you're one of the leaders there, but with the Gates Foundation, is, is some of the most impressive work in the country, I think, uh, particularly around housing authorities. Uh, what you're doing, King County, the city of Seattle, all really, really uh, great leadership. So congratulations, and thank you for, for joining us today. I wanted to ask each of you a, a, a different question. Um, Michelle, and, and actually one, just to, to preach for a moment, th this issue of rapid rehousing is incredibly important. We, uh, as I think most folks know, we had a billion and a half dollars in the Recovery Act for the Homeless Prevention and Rapid Rehousing Program. We expected to ha help about a half a million people. Um, we're at 1.3 million and counting. And the big lesson we've learned, and it's an incredibly important lesson when resources are tight, is, which I think Michael uh, talked about specifically, you actually need less money for a shorter period of time than you would think to help most families get out of homelessness. 75% of the folks we've helped with HPRP have been families with kids. And a, a security deposit, a utility bill, the kinds of things, Michelle, that you talked about, is often the difference between homelessness and staying housed. Uh, and particularly, rapid rehousing has been the most effective use of, uh, of that money. The good news is we've learned that. We've got a, a program called the Emergency Solutions Grant Program, ESG, used to be the Emergency Shelter Grant. We changed it to be able to do more rapid rehousing. It's a lot less money than was in the Recovery Act. And so this idea, using TANF is a great example of how communities have said, aha, a light bulb has gone off. They weren't as, as far ahead as, as you two were. But this is really starting to happen. Our worry is that it ends with the end of the Recovery Act money. And we're not going to be able to fund it alone at HUD. The good news is a lot of places are figuring out, hey, this is going to save me money. And so I would just urge all of you, VA is doing this, figuring out how to take existing resources like TANF, uh, like the grant and per diem, uh, and use them for rapid rehousing is incredibly important around family homelessness. So, um, the the question I had, Michelle, was uh, one of the things in your in, in the presentation that I noticed was 55 percent of families either maintained income, employment, or mainstream benefits, or obtained employment. And I was actually struck, particularly on the benefits side, that that's relatively is lower than I might expect, and I may be reading the data wrong. It's, you have so many of the agencies around the table that are providing these mainstream benefits. What would you recommend that we do to make these benefits more accessible 
um, and to make sure, particularly for homeless families, that we're bringing together you know, the set of things that they need right at that time when you are doing the rapid rehousing to, to make sure that they stay housed. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm always surprised that it is low. Is the mainstream resources numbers is, are as low as they are as well. Um, I think what we've seen that works is um, I mentioned this infusion of services while fam when families first arrive in the shelter. Part of that is the eligibility review to make sure families are aware of the benefits that they are eligible for. Uh, for and even at that time, there's families that don't want to follow through with the process. And the types of things that I see that put them off often are just real, um, they, fee they walk into um, an employment office or a DWS office to get a review and they don't feel welcome, they don't know where to go, they don't feel like they're treated well. So it's just sort of that real frontline stuff can really affect families for a long time. They're always concerned about how uh, one benefit might affect another benefit. They're worried about um, you know, giving information to DWS and then having, you know, something happen with um, children and family services that might affect their kids being with them or not being with them. So they're worried about sharing of information. Um, but really, I think the families are very focused on employment. They want to be employed. They, you know, they, they certainly are interested in the benefits, but they want to be employed. And having those services all available on site at the shelter when people are homeless is important and continuing that into the first couple months of housing. That crucial time of moving from shelter into housing is really important. It's when there's a lot of changes happening with those families um, and, it, and it determines whether they're going to move on that road of increasing their income in any way and be able to pay that rent after that. And I agree with you, uh, Secretary Donovan. We learned al along with you how many families did not need a lot of support and did not need a long-term support. Prior to rapid rehousing, we put almost all of our families out on two-year programs, whether it was TBRA or tried to get them onto some other long-term subsidy. And when a family's sitting in front of you with the needs that they have, you want to help them and you feel like, if I have two years of help I can give you, I want to give it to you, so you do. But we learned so much and, ha and our frontline staff learned so much whenever they were worried about saying that a family could go out and maybe be successful after a couple, a couple of months, we would remind them, but look at all these other families that were successful. And it's like we have to keep even retraining our staff and reminding our staff how successful this is. And, um, you know, of all the families that we serve, only about 60 of those families even access our rapid rehousing funding. About 5% we put onto other programs, but the, the remaining percent move out of shelter on their own without even the rapid rehousing funding. So there's a lot of help that you can provide right up front that's very minimal and you can really spread those dollars further. So. Yep, great. Um, if there are more ideas about how to bring those mainstream benefits together or break down barriers, I think that would be extremely useful to the, to the group. Michael, you, um, very struck by uh, some of the similar themes about the duration of the assistance. And um, I particularly wanted to focus on your point about our mainstream uh, programs, public housing, vouchers. Uh, and for those of you who don't speak HUD, uh, Moving to Work is a demonstration program that we've entered into with some of the highest performing housing authorities around the country to give them dramatically more flexibility in how they implement uh, our programs, to be able to move money between programs, uh, to change the structure and the nature of the programs themselves. So it's very broad flexibility. We're actually trying to get an increase in the number of agencies right now from Congress that we can, uh, that we can help. But at the end of the day, it's going to remain, uh, at least in the short run, a relatively small number of the overall housing authorities that we have. And so I, I wonder if you could help us think about Assuming we have, you know, vouchers, public housing with us for some for some time, what are the things that we can do to make them uh, better targeted or more useful uh, in housing homeless families? And I'm particularly thinking of the work that we've done around VASH, for example, where we've paired services with with vouchers. Um, any lessons there, or the work that we've done? We're actually right now propose uh, we've proposed in the past, uh, and we're working on some other ideas around pairing our vouchers with uh, HHS's programs in order to uh, house homeless families. So I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm curious, short of just 
making uh, moving to work available to everybody, what other ideas and thoughts you might have for us? The the main problems that make those two programs unfit to intervene into homelessness include the waiting lists. They all work off these hideous waiting lists. And so if you're a homeless family coming to the Tacoma Housing Authority for help from the public, the, the regular public housing program or the voucher program, we're going to tell you, first of all, our waiting lists are closed. You can't even sign up. Yeah. Or but, but if Michael, you can't, I mean, when I ran a voucher program in New York, we, we made a priority in our plan for, for homeless families, and we could skip them uh, based, on, based on that, right? You could do that. And even if you came to the housing authority and got a voucher on the spot, you're still a month away from housing. Right. Because you still have to find yourself a landlord to use it. There's paper shuffling to do. We have to inspect and so forth. It is not an emergency form of assistance. The other problem with it is um, relates to some lessons that came out of our own experience with rapid rehousing that it, in the county, that it is really hard to tell which families need assistance to avoid ho homelessness. We don't know of a tool that allows you to tell that. And even if you satisfied yourself that this family needs assistance that will save them from homelessness that will otherwise happen, for reasons Secretary Donovan described, most families do not need that deep permanent subsidy to stabilize. So it is an ineffective or it's an inefficient use of a housing dollar if your goal is to intervene into homelessness and stabilize a family. The voucher and the public housing programs, I think, are primarily designed to alleviate poverty. They are not designed to intervene into crisis. And this is why we are changing the character of our housing dollars in the ways I described, because right now, b before we were thinking along these lines, the Tacoma Housing Authority, the largest source of housing resources in the city, was largely on the sidelines for intervening into family homelessness, or youth homelessness for that matter. And that was not a comfortable place to be for the largest source of housing resources. And with our rapid rehousing partnership with Pierce County, we feel like we are now a useful partner. Well, I would urge both of you um, to if you have additional thoughts and ideas, and I'm going to, then we're going to have hopefully 10 to 15 minutes of additional discussion, but just an urging to send us additional ideas because, again, you have around this table, I think, a representative of every major federal agency that could possibly intervene um, and has programs that could be tapped into. So, if you have some thoughts and ideas that you haven't been able by the time we finish this, brief discussion to get on the table, please let us know. Send them to Barbara and she'll get it circulated because it's an opportunity to really um, push the envelope a bit. So do others have thoughts, discussion, questions for our panelists? Go ahead, Susan. Thank you. Um, this year we were able to put out $100 million to completely to community providers to um, help veterans and their families. This has been our first ability to include the family in the intervention as we try to end homelessness for veterans. And we welcome Michelle as a brand new recipient um, of the, the grant this year. Um, from your perspective, can you say a little bit about why you thought that this particular grant would help you out? not just the monetary part sure. of it, but how it would help you in your strategy to assist veterans and their families, and if in your experience there were unique issues and challenges that the grant will allow you to address. Sure. Um, I will say that our relationship and partnership with the uh, Veterans Administration Hospital staff and the homeless program now is better than it's ever been before. We uh, partnered with them on the application for this program. Um, because we came together and realized, you know, the, the veteran families are not, have, n have not traditionally connected well with the VA programs that are in our community. 
And we could be that bridge in a much more direct way through this funding, um, reaching out to those families and letting them know that there's this program available that can help them become housed is a great way to get them interested engaged in working with that staff from the Veterans Administration. And the other, pro the, the hospital functions and the other programs, the employment, the, the vocational rehab programs that the VA has are quite extensive and um, really helpful to the families, but traditionally they hadn't engaged very much. So that's the main reason why we wanted to have this partnership, to really build up that connection between our households that we had in the shelter and the Veterans Administration. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the challenges that we're, we're still attempting to overcome is sort of the outreach side from the Veterans Administration folks coming into the shelter and engaging directly with our clients. Um, the, we, we have the challenge of identifying folks, but then getting them down to get their assessment and their eligibility. So, so sort of that outreach is the area that we're really focusing on, and we're sitting around the table trying to figure out how that can happen. Um, really developing that relationship is the key to getting families enrolled in all of those programs. And so we're excited about this opportunity. We've, we've started meeting with them, and um, you know, again, as I said, it will also free up the dollars for other families as well, and we can spread the other dollars farther. That's great. Other questions, comments for our partners? Go ahead. Well, it's uh, it's great to hear both of you talk about your um, your collaborations with your local workforce agencies. Um, so my comment and then questions, earlier this summer at the Department of Labor, we I, awarded... I'm sorry, can I interrupt one oh, second? You might reintroduce yourself okay, just so sure. if people are listening, they get yep. some idea of... Thank you, Ben Siegel you. at the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, so, you know, just wanted to, uh, you know, thank and congratulate both of you for your for your close working relationships with your local workforce agencies. And the comment I wanted to make is that earlier this summer at the Department of Labor, we awarded $150 million to 26 projects across the country under a new program called the Workforce Innovation Fund. And the, the purpose of this fund is to uh, invest in strategies that deliver workforce services more efficiently uh, and achieve better outcomes. And of the 26 projects that we funded, three of them are integrating and coordinating workforce uh, services with housing-related services uh, through better and more consistent case management, like the example you raised, uh, through bundling services, um, and you know, and through cross-agency co uh, collaborations. And of those three, one of them uh, is specifically focused on family homelessness, and that's in Tacoma. So it's it's great uh, that you're here, and that uh, that that Tacoma Housing Authority is involved in the project. And you know, what we've heard from this cohort of programs, as well as others in the field, is that you know, as it relates to to workforce services and and homeless services, the the barriers aren't so much kind of structural in nature that require waivers or whatnot, but they tend to be uh, more about, uh, you know, coordination and alignment and connecting funding streams. So my two questions for you guys, either or both, you know, one, can you speak to that? And, and you know, we haven't really done a lot of evaluation of this coordination, and all three of these projects will be heavily evaluated. So can you speak to, is it a structural issue? you know, versus a coordination issue. And the second question, I'm curious to, to know in both of your models, how are you partnering with and engaging employers, um, you know, as it relates to moving people into jobs and keeping them in jobs and hopefully moving up career pathways? Yes. Um, um, to speak to your second question first, we really partner with our Department of Workforce Services. We don't do a lot on the employer um, engaging with employers, though we do um, serve on some of their committees um, around employment and talking about the types of employment um, that work for, for our population. I think the, uh, I would agree that the challenges seem to be more coordinating than structural. Is that how you phrased it? Um, a lot of, of what we found is that our families are often young, single parents who haven't worked for at all or haven't worked for a very long time. Other uh, uh, individuals that are homeless haven't worked for a very long time. And engaging with Department of Work with, uh, and I'm not sure about the WIA um, program, but uh, engaging with our workforce service agency around finding the kind of employment that will work for a family and coordinating with all the other things that single mom might need <coughs> to get back to work. So the daycare portion of it, the transportation portion of it, huge. All those pieces have to come together for that employment to work. 
And so, um, it, you know, that's why we're excited to move forward with this, you know, one case manager from, from Department of Workforce Services is, is along with the road home working with the family because without those other pieces, the employment doesn't happen. So. Since unfortunately it, it wasn't ready to go and we do have George here, I, if you could take just a couple of minutes talking about what this TANF report will do because I think it may trigger some ideas where other departments have mainstream programs that they could s see this as a template for what is moving forward. As soon as it's ready, we will have it out the door. But George, you might yeah. uh, want to describe what we've been doing to try and get a manual, if you will, to people on the ground. Uh, I mean, part of this is a recognition, and I'm George Sheldon with the Administration for Children and Families, a recognition on our part that there can be innovative ways that TANF can uh, and states, to a large extent, are going to be in the driver's seat on this, uh, which is incumbent, I think, on local agencies to really work with your states. But what we're hoping to do is to lay out a, a roadmap uh, as to what, how states can more innovatively use TANF dollars uh, to um, promote ending homelessness and to get people back to work. Uh, and ultimately, that's the goal of TANF. Uh, and, and a lot of states, and I, I recognize the difficulty in states having been a state director, uh, right now state budgets are crunched, and TANF becomes that kind of flexible uh, funding mechanism. Uh, so, uh, so I think we also recognize, the Secretary recognizes, this, there's, this is going to be a competition piece, uh, but I really think it's incumbent on the direction that we send out um, to really show how this can be a cost saver for you uh, in, in your overall system, uh, in your overall cash assistance effort. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Go ahead, David. Um, just brief, I'm Dave Rust with the Social Security Administration Office of Policy. Um, I was just wondering, you know, many of the people you probably serve are eligible for either SSI or SSDI benefits. They're, it's a hard population for us because that determination process takes about three months. We give those cases priority, but the recontacting and working with people to get medical evidence and so forth, uh, do, you, uh, do you work with our field offices and our regional offices? Do you coordinate with them and do you help channel people to us that may be eligible? We, we do. We have our state has adopted the SOAR model of enrolling homeless individuals and families onto Social Security programs. And uh, our, in fact, our state Department of Workforce Services agency, again, came to the table and has a team of individuals specifically trained. And so any of our uh, families who are receiving TANF um, are eligible to work with these specially trained um, folks to get them, help them through the so social security process. So that's definitely part of the initial evaluation and, and follow through. We count um, Social Security, SSI, and SSD as among the resources to um, arrange if the family is available. Social Security is not on site like our public assistance program is, but we know where they are. In fact, um, the main thing you can do for a family eligible for SSI to help them get it is to stabilize their housing. It's, it's, it's a hard process to participate in if you're moving around a lot. No, if they stay in one place, it's much easier for us to, to find them and contact them and work with them. Michael, can you talk just for a minute about the school? I, I'm really fascinated as a housing authority with your decision to stabilize families and by doing so, stabilize the school and seeing that as part of the mission of uh, empowering and putting families on a pathway to a more prosperous future. I'm very familiar with the school data that says, regardless of level of education, regardless of anything else, the single most important determining factor in a child's ability to succeed and learn in school is actually how many times they move and how many turnovers there are, that that has the biggest impact. So. Tell me a little bit, I mean, are you kind of alone out there doing this, or are other housing authorities picking this up as a strategy? I think housing authorities need to be 
interested in these ways in education for three reasons that the alert housing authorities will recognize. The first is their understanding of a broader mission to help families succeed not just as tenants, but as parents, students, wage earners, and builders of assets. We want families to come to us and prosper, and for their time with us to be transforming and temporary. And we count education to be an essential part of that transformation. And if not for the parents, then for goodness sakes, for the children, because we don't want to house them when they grow up. Second, we are real estate developers. And we develop communities that will not succeed socially or financially unless the schools that serve them succeed. The third reason is in many, if not most areas, the school districts are not getting it done. They need help, and being an alert civic citizen in our community, we want to know our role. And we found that we are at a lot of discussions where we have to explain, well, why is a public housing authority at this table talking about education? But it doesn't take long for them to understand and welcome us. Very impressive. Um, I'm going to turn the program back over to Barbara Poppy at this point, um, talking a bit about our opening doors agenda, um, moving us to the next step. So, Barbara. Great. Uh, well, I am very pleased to announce today uh, that we have officially amended the opening doors plan. Uh, and it is um, with each of you, and this is just hot off of uh, all the presses today. Uh, this amendment um, speaks to, directly to the issue of education. Um, the plan has been amended to speak to the educational outcomes of children experiencing homelessness, and it's added some very specific steps as to how we can prevent and end youth homelessness. This is based on the work um, that came to fruition at the last council meeting um, that uh, Commissioner Samuels led, and it, it sets forth a framework for the council and all of our work around ending youth homelessness. So um, I just want to point out that from the Obama administration perspective, uh, we too believe that education education is the key opportunity for all Americans and that children and families experiencing homelessness are too often severely limited in their ability to take advantage of that opportunity. And so with this amendment um, to the Opening Doors Plan, we believe we have a more comprehensive approach um, toward our goals. So I want to thank all of you in this room for the efforts you put into bringing that amendment forward. I want to um, turn, though, to uh, where we sit today, and part of uh, the work that has been done in getting ready for this council meeting has been um, getting prepared to do an annual update to Congress on the progress that has been achieved, the challenges that we faced, and getting that information um, to, uh, to Congress um, as consistent with the mandate they've given us. So um, you do not have a copy of this um, document. Um, it is currently sitting with your council policy liaisons. But I wanted to let you know that we've got some key messages that have emerged as we've looked at the progress that we've made. First is that it, all council agencies um, continue to be committed to the plan. Uh, we call out the remarkable progress there's been in reductions in veterans' homelessness. We also speak to the 1.3 million people, as Secretary Donovan had noted, that were served through the Homeless Prevention Rapid Rehousing Program, or Recovery Act Program. And we also are highlighting the new youth framework for the first time the federal government having a plan and um, intent to, to make progress on ending youth homelessness. So as we move forward, um, what the data is showing us is that it, it continues to be important to establish these collaborations between mainstream and targeted and community programs, that we've got to continue to target resources ever more effectively. And then we also have to be willing to make the changes that are necessary here in Washington and on the ground. I think as our speaker spoke to, that ability to change the direction and to adopt ever more evidence-based practices is important. We know that when uh, results can occur, it's because new investments are strategically deployed when existing resources are strategically deployed. And so this uh, report to Congress will reflect those as we put it into clearance, which is what we are here to, to ask uh, for you to do. 
Well, I know you don't have a document in front of you. Um, you've participated in a lot of the discussion, and I know that um, each of the agencies will have an opportunity to have that specific discussion around the document um, in your department. But I guess I'd like to see if there are specific questions for Barbara as we look to um, getting this document to the Hill and then um, ask uh, really for authorization to incorporate the comments and, and move it on. It's a, it's a little awkward saying, you know, take our word for it, but it is really in your departments and that discussion will inform the final document. But let's start with the questions of, of Barbara about where we are and where we are going. Kathleen, I have more of an admonition than a uh, than a question here. I just the point that that Barbara made about about our progress. We're going we're to have the point in time count out, which is our most important kind of annual uh, metric on how we're doing around homelessness. We'll have that in in the next few weeks, and the I think the call to arms for all of us is that we need to take so many of these good things that we've started to the next level. Um, we are making progress on, on veterans homelessness, remarkable progress. Frankly, we've got to accelerate that if we're going to get to know veterans homelessness in 2015, functional zero. Um, and, and in family homelessness, in chronic homelessness, um, it's going to be even more of a challenge to get to the, to the goals. And so I think the, the big thing, and we've been very focused on this in our budget for this year, I think we're very encouraged by the thinking that folks are doing, have been doing in the budgets that were just submitted for 2014. But that's the last year of, of our budgets before we get to 2015 um, and, and these goals. And if we don't take a lot of the things that we've talked about that are at um, really the uh, pilot or demonstration level and take them mainstream, really think about for us, this is, okay, not what are we doing just in our homeless programs, but what are we doing with the billions of dollars, the 5.4 million families that we help in and, and with Section 8 vouchers and in privately owned housing, we're just not going to get there. So I would just ask all of you, as we reflect on the progress that we have made, uh, to recommit that we have to step up the work that we're doing, particularly in our mainstream programs, uh, if we're going to actually achieve the goals of the plan. I think that's a, a wise admonition. Um, I also should tell you all, those of you who don't follow um, some of the HHS program budgets nearly as closely as you might follow your own, um, TANF is um, due to expire. And um, the good news is that the CR that will be voted on tomorrow by the House of Representatives does continue TANF. Um, we don't have a budget this year, so absent a budget, we really needed them to be specifically included. So at least TANF has a life that will last, assuming that the CR passes, until March. But just to put that on the radar screen as we talk about important mainstream programs, um, the TANF authorization actually goes away. Um, absent some new act by Congress to move it on. So we, we think it's safe in the CR, um, assuming both the House and the Senate uh, pass it before they um, leave town. But uh, we are watching that very, very closely because I think that's a, a, an interesting and critical piece of this puzzle for... A little small. Yeah, piece. yeah. Um, it would be good to use the mainstream programs if they continue to exist. Um, other comments for Barbara or questions? Uh, if not, could I get a, just a voice vote on an authorization to move our policy forward in a report to Congress? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. I guess I needed to ask for the opposed. I forgot. I almost skipped on by that. Um, well, I think, I think Secretary Donovan has really provided um, a good closing challenge that um, as part of our evaluation and reevaluation of the 2014 budgets is to take a look at these initiatives which are um, in some ways embedded into a lot of the policies and practices moving forward to make sure that they are not just um, 
sidelined small programs, but that they could be more mainstreamed and to hopefully bring back um, to our agency leaders uh, some thoughtful analysis of what is working. I really appreciate one of the things I think that's been so helpful at a number of the meetings that we've had is to have those of you who are experts on the ground um, who are making um, these programs work and are actually rehousing people, putting them on a path to prosperity, give us reports back about what works and what doesn't work. I think that's the best sort of connector that we could have um, moving forward. Um, we are scheduled for uh, a meeting currently planned for December. Um, it is a focus on homeless veterans and I just would urge you to take a look at the dates and make sure that they work for everybody because it would be good to have, um, if somehow we need to change that, we will, we will get around to that. But that's going to be our, our fourth and final meeting of the council this year. Um, again, I want to thank both Michelle and Michael for being here today. It's um, not only your work is very impressive, but participating in this um, council meeting gives us an opportunity to have that work um, engaged in by basically every department at the federal level who can impact uh, the kind of work we need to do together. So this is really an important opportunity. I want to thank our visitors who are here on the webcast and remind them that this will be archived on the um, Homelessness Council's website uh, into the future. And thank you all for being here today. And thanks for a good meeting. Thank you, Sean, for hosting us. Thanks for your leadership. You're here. All right.